So our speaker tonight is Max Levitt Schaufer, who he studied biology and graduated from William Patterson in 2020. He first became involved with honeybee research during his undergraduate career, where he was a part of an ongoing study looking at the effects of climate change on honeybee foraging preference and identifying possible phylogenetic mismatches between honeybees and the plants they pollinate. After graduation, Max joined Rutgers University as a research assistant working on studies of the interactions pesticides have on honeybee health. Specifically, how common pesticides found in blueberry fields affect the development of larval honeybees. And Max is planning to start working on his PhD in the fall of 2024. So Max, I'm now going to give you permission and we should be good. Okay. All right, awesome. Uh, just give me one moment while I get the screen sharing thing up. Okay. All righty. Cool. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. All righty. All right. So I'm going to be talking to you guys a little bit about honeybees today. Um, the title of my presentation is What's the Buzz About Honeybees? And it's by yours truly. All righty. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get into a little bit about the biology and the life history of honeybees. Um, so, so their Latin binomial name is Apis mellifera. Their common name is the European honeybee. And they're a member of the order of Hymenoptera, which includes ants, bees, and wasps. So on our right here, we have a phylogenetic tree. And the phylogenetic tree is used to show the evolutionary history of species and how they relate to one another. So if you look down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see ants, bees, and wasps, Hymenoptera. And then you can see your guys' group, Lepidoptera, butterflies, butterflies, and then uh, regular flies are, looks like Hymenoptera is a descendant or is the ancestor of those two groups. Alrighty. So, so bees are a eusocial species. Um, so what eusociality means is multiple generations will live together and they jointly care for the brood. Uh, there's always a distinct caste system of reproductive and non-reproductive individuals. In honeybees, there are three such castes. There are, are the worker bees, the drone bees, and then the queen bees. So here's just a close-up view of each of those three castes. So you can see here on the left-hand side is a drone. Drones tend to be larger and more bulbous than workers or queens, and they also have these two really large compound eyes that meet at the center at the top of their head. Um, in the center here is a worker bee. And then to the right is a queen bee. And you might notice that there's a little bit of paint on the back of her thorax. Um, that is just to allow easy identification uh, so that when a beekeeper opens up the hive, she's easy to spot. All right, all righty. So honeybees are what we are what we call cavity nesters. Um, so that means that they will modify an existing cavity to create their home. Um, oftentimes this is a tree, such as in this picture here, we can see that, um, that there's a lot of comb going on on the inside of this tree cavity. Um, but this could also be the open space in your wall. Um, cavity nesting is also a major reason why bees are so useful in agriculture. Um, so if you see here, these are honeybee hives, which are essentially just man-made empty tree cavities. Alrighty, so first let's talk about the queen. Alrighty, so the queen bee is genetically identical to the other workers. Um, what designates her to develop into a queen is gonna be the diet she is fed and then the type of cell that her egg is laid into. So these are the couple different types of cells. So the cells that are hanging down kind of like icicles, those are called superseature cells or queen cells. Um, and then you can see all the other little hexonical, hexonical cells. Those are the normal, normal worker cells. Um, so yeah, so the queen bee, um, 
What causes her to develop into a queen as opposed to a worker depends on the diet she is fed and the cell type that she is raised in, like the cells I just showed you. Um, and then a larval bee and a larval queen will be fed the same thing, um, but in different proportions. Um, th they're fel fed hunt pollen, honey, and royal jelly. Uh, royal jelly is produced by young nurse bees, hypopharyngeal glands. It is a very nutritious substance. Um, Alrighty. All right, so a queen's main job is to maintain the colony, the population of the colony. Um, once a virgin queen emerges from her cell, she'll go on a nuptial flight and she will travel to a drone congregation area and collect the sperm that she will use for her entire life. She stores the sperm in an organ known as a spermatheca. And then when laying an egg, she chooses whether to fertilize it or not. If she chooses to fertilize it, it'll become a female and it'll become a worker. And if she doesn't choose to fertilize it, it'll become a drone. And then speaking of drones, that's who we're gonna talk about next. So you can see here just another, this is the side view of a drone. All right, and then this is the front view of a drone. This really, this is a really good picture because it shows how large their eyes are. These are something that we hypothesize are used to spot virgin queens on their nuptial flights. So the sole purpose of a drone bee is for reproduction. So there's a, they spend 75% of their time doing absolutely nothing. They can't feed themselves, they can't clean themselves, and they rely on their sisters to do all the work for them. So they're just pretty much lazy guys that just hang around all the time. But that 25% of the time that they're actually doing something is they're looking for um, they're looking for a mate. So drones, drones will congregate in the same area uh, year after year. And often this is a high, a high area such as a church steeple or a radio tower or you know, something like that. And then on the right here, we can see, so this is a drone, they don't have a stinger. Instead of a stinger, they have a two-pronged penis. Um, so the lower picture is you can really see the two prongs there. And then the upper picture is just the reproductive organ excised from the um, specimen in its entirety. So something very interesting about honeybees is that they are called, they are a haplodiploid species. We call it haplodiploidy. Um, and what this means is that all the drones are going to be fatherless. So, so it's common among hymenoptera. Um, and what happens is males have one set of chromosomes um, and they come from unfertilized eggs and then females such as workers will have two sets of chromosomes, making them a diploid species. Why is this important? Um, because it's a possible evolutionary mechanism for altruism. Um, and altruism, we just defined as a tendency of an individual to help another individual out. And therefore, it's a possible evolutionary mechanism for eusociality. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the worker bee. All right. So a worker bee is always going to be female, um, no matter what, as in a drone will always be a male, no matter what. So workers have a variety of jobs to do, and what designates the job they do is going to be the age of the worker. Um, so from the time that an egg is laid um, to the time of emergence it takes approximately 21 days. And then when a worker first emerges, they will spend the first half of their life as a nurse bee. Um, nurse bees are responsible for taking care of developing bees and the queen. Then, as the worker ages, they will take on more responsibilities from guarding the hive entrance and maintaining colony ventilation to building comb and storing pollen and nectar. Only in their old age will a worker become a forager. When honeybee reaches this point in their development, they will search the countryside for resources, bringing back whatever the colony needs to survive. In many ways, the honeybee colony is run by the workers and not the queen. I feel like that's a pretty common misconception. Um, so the workers run the colony and you can look at it as a super organism with each individual's behavior playing part in the greater whole of the colony. Um, workers are, worker bees are actually really, really good at communicating with each other. And they do this through a behavior known as the waggle dance, which I think is one of the most interesting forms of insect communication. So next we're gonna have a little video and this is, it's only about 20 seconds, and this is going to be the waggle dance. 
So you can see that the bees are kind of following each other and moving in a figure eight pattern. And then you can see the waggle. And they just keep going back and forth and back and forth. And this bee right now is sending a lot of messages to the other workers, even though she's not speaking, even though, you know, she's, she doesn't have a mouth or anything like that. She's telling a lot of information. And so the waggle dance consists of two phases. There's the waggle phase, which is when they move their little butts back and forth. Um, and then the return phase. The forager will perform the waggle dance by moving in a figure eight pattern, as you saw. And then the forager will move in a straight line while waggling their admin, turn to the right, and return to the starting position. Another waggle run is performed. And then the forager will, will turn to the left and return to the starting position and repeat the cycle again. There's a, a duration of the waggle phase corresponds to the distance of the resource. So the shorter the waggle phase, the closer the resource is. The intensity of the waggle tells foragers the quality of the resource. So a bee that has found a really, really good flower will waggle their abdomens ferociously to draw the attention of other foragers. The angle of the waggle run with respect to the pool of gravity in the hive informs the foragers of the source of the forage source located with respect to the angle of the sun. So just to clarify, I, I know that might be a little confusing. Um, if a flower is located at X degrees to the left of the relative position of the sun, the forager's waggle phase will be at the same angle X in the same direction, but with the regards to the pool of gravity. Um, hives are completely black. Um, they're pitch back. There's no light inside. So honeybees need to rely on touch and other forms of chemical signals to communicate to each other. Um, so this dance actually has another function, um, which is a, it allows honeybees to communicate potential nest sites. So that behavior is known as swarming. And it is one of my very favorite behaviors. All right. So swarming. So right here we have we have a honeybee swarm. And every year a colony will split. The queen and a large portion of the workers will leave the hive and go search for a new nest site, while those workers left at home will raise a new queen. The swarming event is essentially a colony's way of reproducing. Uh, this happens every year. Um, in New Jersey, this usually happens around April. Um, however, there ub there are, it could happen subsequently throughout the year. Um, it's usually not a great thing. Uh, beekeepers don't like it when their bees swarm because they're losing a lot of, a lot of their, um, I guess, property. Um, so uh, the process of selecting a new nest site is a democratic process. The swarm will congregate in a single location, like on this, on this location, on this picture here. Um, uh, clustering together to create a beard. The scouts are sent out to locate a possible nest. Um, when they return, the scout bee will perform the waggle dance. Only this time she is telling her sisters a location that she thinks will make a good nest site for, for this new, for the new home. Uh, the ferocity of the waggle communicates the quality of the new home. As she dances, more scouts will join her until finally the swarm lifts off and travels to their new home. If multiple, if multiple scouts, um, dance at the same time, the swarm will travel to whatever location has the most dancers. In this way, the honeybees cast their vote for a new home, therefore democracy. Alrighty, and this is just a little video of me um, capturing a swarm. Uh, it's not the best method, but this was one of the first ones that I went to catch. So all of those are bees, they're probably about maybe 5,000, 10,000 there. And I'm shaking them off into what we call a nuke box. Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit about beekeeping. All right, so most people do not realize that honeybees, they're, they're not native to North America. Um, there are plenty of other wild bees that are, uh, like sweat bees, cuckoo bees, bumblebees. But the European honeybee, as its name suggests, is, is from Europe. Uh, it was first introduced to North America when settlers came from Europe. 
So a wild push population must have been established when a rogue swarm successfully relocated to a nice tree cavity. Um, so get back. All right. There have been many iterations of uh, man-made honeybee hives. Some were overturned baskets, some were clay containers, and some were modified wild hives. Although it's still sometimes used today, all these hive designs have one major flaw. Um, in order to harvest your honey crop, it was necessary to destroy at least part of the colony, if not it, it in its entirety. Um, this was the case for most of apiculture history. Uh, that is, until a major innovation in the hive design happened in the 1800s in Philadelphia, PA, the development of the Langstrumpf hive. The Langstrumpf hive is the most common bee design today and for good reason. So this is a Langstrumpf hive here, uh, most commonly used today, and it has a modular design. Um, so the base is a deep box, which is going to be the second arrow. So this is a deep, and you can see how it's larger than the two boxes on top of it. The two boxes on top of it are, are they're called uh, honey supers. And that's where bees will store their honey. And then in the deep boxes, that's where bees will keep their brood. Um, so the base design is a deep box, a four-sided rectangle with an open top and bottom. And then as the colony grows, more deeps can be stacked on top of each other to allow for the expansion of the brood chamber, or they can be removed uh, to prevent swarming events uh, in beekeeping, we call this splitting the hive. Um, and this is a technique used to prevent swarming. Uh, a bottom board is placed on the deep closest to the ground and a lid is put on top of a hive. And a lid is put on the top of a hive. This allows bees to seal the colony off to the elements and allows for only one entrance. Um, they have a file cabinet design. Um, as you can see here in this bottom picture, this is the top of a frame, or this is the top of a deep box. And you can see all the little bees going all over it. Um, the base design is 10 frames per deep and 10 frames per hive, but there can be more or less depending on, depending on what the beekeeper wants to do. You can have boxes that have eight, eight frames of comb in it. You can have boxes that have six frames of comb in it, but the standard, um, the standard is 10. And the reason this is so innovative is because it allows for um, damage-free handling of the bees. So you can go into a beehive, you can sort through everything, you can check out, you can check out the health of your bees without destroying it. Um, and then you can also harvest honey without destroying the hive in its entirety. Alrighty, so this is a little video of us doing our honey harvest at Rutgers. Um, this is at our Creams, Cream Ridge Agricultural Extension site. So this is, a, this is a centrifuge where we spin the frames of, we open up the wax caps on the honey, or we open up the wax caps on the brood frames, and then we spin them to get all the honey out. The honey you know, flows through this and then goes into a, uh, goes into a decapping tank. Okay. So commercial beekeepers, they live a uh, transient lifestyle. They ship their bees all over the country on pollination contracts. Um, in these contracts, beekeepers leave their colonies at farms where a crop requires cross-pollination. Um, the first contracts are usually in California with the, uh, the almond blooms. And then that usually happens around mid-February and continues to mid-March. Then the bees are shipped across the country. Um, to New Jersey to harvest or to, um, I'm sorry, to cross pollinate blueberries. So uh, in New Jersey, blueberry bloom occurs in April and goes all the way through to June. So bees are usually in on April and stay for a predetermined number of weeks. Unfortunately, beekeepers that keep their bees in blueberry fields are running into trouble. Decades ago, a beekeeper could have a contract in a blueberries and then go on with the same colonies for multiple other pollinations. And they would also have a significant honey crop. Nowadays though, this is not the case. Hives are coming out of blueberry fields significantly weakened and with little honey crop. Why is this happening? What is causing this drop in honeybee health? Well, that's, that's really what my research focuses on. All right, so this is the research section. 
So here are some pictures of the various techniques or various things that we do at our lab. Um, yeah. So I work for Rutgers and I work under Chelsea Abegg. Uh, I believe she just got her PhD. Um, I know she was taking her qualifiers recently, um, but you know, it's me and her. And then we work on pollinator pesticide interactions. So we do three main types of work. We'll do behavioral studies, um, which you can see in this picture to the right. Um, these are a bunch of flight tunnels. Uh, we'll do larval toxicity work, which is the center picture here. You can see all these little white things. Those are baby honeybees. And then we'll also do pollen work. All right. Um, so the first thing we're gonna go over are behavioral studies that we do. Um, so the hypothesis is Apis mellifer favors uh, bushes recently sprayed with herbicides. Um, so we tested several common herbicides found in blueberry fields. Some of them are quash, abound, xyram. Uh, there are multiple other ones too. Um, our materials and methods is we created a flight tunnel with a nuke inside. Um, we presented bees with the choice. So they could either choose a bush sprayed with a pesticide or they could choose a bush sprayed with water. And then we counted the widgets to each bush for 30 minutes. So in this picture, this is Chelsea. She's spraying down one of the blueberry bushes with water. Um, I wouldn't be this close if it was a pesticide. And then this next picture. So this is the inside of a flight tunnel. So we made all of these from scratch. Um, when we first put this up, it was nothing but an empty plot. And we put up nine different flight tunnels using, we modified hoop houses. And we put this shade cloth over the top. And then there's a center divider that keeps um, the two nukes in the hive separated from each other. And then this is just, this is just the counter. All right, so our larval toxicity work. Um, so our hypothesis is that larval honeybee development is impacted by trace amounts of fungicides that are brought back by foragers. Um, we use our materials and methods, or we use globally accepted larval grafting techniques to acquire larval honeybees from experimental nukes. And then we feed them a diet laced with fungicides and we record the larval mor mortality. So, sorry, one moment. Alrighty. So this is our lab. Um, on the left-hand side is a lab. We, we have to do, we have to make a clean lab. I'm sorry, I should say that before. So, Honeybee larvae are really susceptible to microorganisms, to temperature, and to humidity. So we do our best to create an environment when we are doing our grafting that mimics the environment that they're raised in. So to do that, I built a little clean room. Um, so... Um, yeah, so this is my little larval grafting station. Um, I wear these goofy goggles because larval honeybees are, they're smaller than a grain of rice. I think they're about one millimeter to two millimeters in length. And what I do is I take them out of their, out of their frames, which you can see in this left-hand picture, and I move them into cell wall plates, which are these guys right here. Um, and then, oops, sorry. Yeah, and then we just record the larval mortality. All right, and then we do a bunch of different pollen work too. So we'll collect pollen samples from experimental hives uh, to send out for analysis. We send this to another lab. We don't do any of the work ourselves. Um, and this identifies different pesticides that could be located in the pollen. Um, and then we also collect pollen samples to perform an acetylysis protocol that breaks down the strong protein coat that all um, pollen is coated in. And then we mount on the slide and perform identification via morphological features. So this is just my little station for when we do the acetylysis process. Um, you know, we use a lot of strong acids, we use a lot of strong bases. It's a, it can be a fairly toxic process. But the final product is this thing to the right. Um, these are all individual pollen granules. Um, they're dyed red because part of the process is staining uh, the pollen granules. 
All right, um, and then that, that's about it. So thank you very much for your time. And then this is my bibliography. Well done. Thank you very much, Max. That was really cool. Um, I always love learning about the Waggle Dance. Every time yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my coursework talks about it, it's always something very fascinating. Um, and then especially, yeah, it's it's in the dark. Uh, the first time I think I heard someone say that, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah, it's very cool. Um, if anyone has any questions and you want, you're comfortable speaking, yeah, uh, sure. please feel free to um, turn your mics on and ask a question. If not, you can put it in the chat and I can relay the question. I, I had a question. I have been reading a book. I just need to turn on the light. And um, about um, how eyes have been developed in various species, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I got to the visual part and uh, with the photoreceptors. And apparently humans can see at 60 to 70 pairs, um, uh, between 60 and 70 cycles per degree. Now, it said the honeybee is down to one, which for a human would be totally blind. So what sense, is that true? And if so, what sense or senses do they use primarily? So yeah, so honeybees actually, they do, they, when they're out foraging and navigating in their natural environment, they can see polarized light. So they see, and they use that to kind of orient themselves. Um, but yes, so honeybees are they're not very good. At, they can't really focus on anything um, because, you know, they have compound eyes, which are, you know, they're made up of hundreds of small individual, individual um, receptors. And so they're not particularly good at seeing specific objects, but they are really good at noticing movement. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, then if the light um, guides them to the flowers where they you know, get their nectar or? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just by light. Well, there, are other, there are other factors too, um, some of which we are not entirely aware of, but plants will release volatile chemicals that honeybees can pick up on. Um, yeah. So the pesticides don't keep them away then? Uh, no, no, pesticides don't. <laughs> kind of too bad for the bees, I guess. But yeah, exactly. Good for the growers, bad for the bees. Well, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I see one question in the chat, and this is from Lee. Uh, Lee said, what are your results or what were your results? So a lot of our results are still tentative. Um, Chelsea is still processing that data. Um, I had a question about the waggle dance. Yeah, the uh, video of it. Uh, there seem to be only a few bees in contact with the waggling bee. So, how is this the general information communicated to everybody about you know this is where you should all go foraging? So, when a bee is doing the waggle dance, they also are releasing pheromones at the same time. So. As they're doing their waggle dance, they'll rela release pheromones that correlate to the strength of the foraging source. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Oops. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? I do. When the bees swarm to a new nest, do they take a bit of everyone with them, like the drones, the workers, and the queen, they all go together on this swarm? So they don't, they will not take drones with them. Um, drones are only active for certain parts of the year uh, because they don't actually do anything. So they're a very big stress on the colony's resources. Um, drones are just there for genetic diversity within the gene pool. Um, so what will happen is, you know, so the older bees, the foragers will go out with the old queen. They'll beard up on usually like a branch or a twig. And then, you know, they'll go out and they'll do their vote. And then, you know, through the waggle dance. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. It's just Donna petting her cat. <laughs> uh, 
um, hi, it's Joyce. Um, I remember reading or hearing that um, if there are two queens in a hive, that there there's aggression and possibly fighting or combat and to see which one is strongest. And is that true or is oh, yeah. that? That's, that's, yeah, that's very true. Um, there you go. Yeah, queens will Leg, be very aggressive on. towards each other. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, so queens will be, uh, if there are multiple queens in a colony at the same time, yes, they will, they will fight each other. If one queen emerges first, she'll actually go around and she'll kill the other queens that while they're still in their super seizure cells. Is that a survival of the fittest kind of strategy, or what um, would be? I mean, you can the, think of the it benefit like that. of that. So, it would be it would probably be, um, you know, in a way, survival of the fittest. This queen emerged first, so that means she's probably the strongest. Um, and there is selection for aggression. So perhaps if she's going around and killing the other queens, that means that her offspring will be more aggressive which means that her hive will do better because they'll be better equipped to defend themselves against predators. Sort of like a spare, huh? Yeah, yeah, you could think spare of it like that. Queen. Mm -hmm. Well, if a queen just... also isn't oh. doing her job, um, uh -huh. like if she's not laying correctly or if she's a drone layer, which means she's only laying um, unfertilized eggs, the yeah. workers will kill her and bring up a new queen. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Oh, do you know Barrett Klein, by the way? Um, he's I don't at think the so. University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. Mm -mm. No, okay. He, yeah. he does um, uh, insect behavior oh, cool. studies and he is specifically studying sleep deprivation in honeybees. Oh, that's very cool. Um, I haven't heard so, about that research. Yeah, you might want to check it out. Yeah, Barrett no, I'll definitely Klein. check that out. Are things improving at all with um, colony collapse? Yeah, so we're, I think we're starting to realize what, what the cause is. And a lot of scientists are suggesting that it is because that they live this transient lifestyle, that they're being shipped all over the country and they didn't evolve for that. So that's affecting their fitness in negative ways. So it's stressing the colonies out, you know, stuff like that. I'm sorry, but, what were you? Yeah, I'm just thinking because Don mm -hmm. was doing, um, bees for quite a number of years and oh very cool the our colonies were being moved around i mean and most of the farmers up here just have hives that stay on their farms in sussex county so how does that translate to you know what you're just saying mm, in sussex what 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 do you mean I'm, well, I'm we're sorry, not moving not our a... hives around like most mm -hmm. of the farmers in this county i mean the the hives are permanent to the farm, so how would call, how would that be stressing? Well, those hives probably don't have colony collapse disorder. So oh, colony collapse yeah. disorder is defined by just mysteriously the hive just being empty, no dead bees, no nothing. Right. We um, we experienced that. I worked for farmers, and maybe fifteen years ago, when that started to become prevalent, mm -hmm. I mean that's what was being found and we experienced it on our own property mm -hmm. I, i'm not too sure that's why that's why it is a mystery you know so a lot of people think it could be the stress of them being shipped across the country as well as the fungicides that they're interacting with or rather the pesticides that they're interacting with it could be there could be an effect of climate change um you know things are warming up uh plants are blooming at different times than what they're used to so there, there are a lot, a lot of different possibilities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any questions? I do have one more. <laughs> um, when they're picking out the new queen bee, how is that done? Is that just random? They just pick any queen or any bee and start feeding her the special formula? Yeah, so it's, it's any egg in the hive can be, can develop into a queen bee. Um, so the workers know what to feed that developing larva based on the angle that the cell is directed at. So if it's the super suture cell, which faces down, 
um, in a dark colony, they know to feed that cell queen food. Like, okay, we're making a queen, we're making a queen. If it's the normal cell and it's just, you know, hanging out at like roughly like a 90 degree angle, they'll know that like, okay, this is, this is a worker bee, so we're gonna feed her worker bee food. Oh. Does that make sense? So it's the angle at which the bees are born in or something? It's the angle at which the cell is Developing? created that tells the workers what food to feed the bee. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it does, thanks. Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat and I don't see anyone with that has their camera on. Um, so I think we are all good. Thank you so much, Max. Yeah, um, no worries. I always love learning about uh, you social insects because I work with ticks and mosquitoes and fleas and they're not they're not social. No, they're not. <laughs> Very <But> solitary. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, but thank you so much everyone for joining. Um, our next meeting will be uh, April 4th. It's in the newsletter. Um, and we will get out that next newsletter to you guys as soon as we have it. And thank you again, Max, so much for joining us tonight. Yep. Um, I wish everyone a good March. <laughs>